Welcome back for the final of four sessions on drugs of abuse. This is Dr. Rockhold. The focus for this session is going to be the psychomotor stimulants that are frequently abused. That includes ecstasy, cocaine, and the dissociative anesthetics. In addition, we'll introduce some aspects of the use of inhalants for abuse and end by talking about the abuse of anabolic androgenic agents. Arguably, the king of psychomotor stimulants may be cocaine, sourced from erythroxylon coca from South America. It can be found as the hydrochloride salt or in the freebase form. Crack is simply a solid form precipitated by dissolving cocaine salt in a base like sodium bicarbonate. The action of cocaine is to inhibit the neuronal membrane reuptake of monoamines, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, resulting in increased synaptic concentration of those three monoamines. The major adverse effects of cocaine are those you would expect from excessive stimulation of the central nervous system and of the sympathetic nervous system. When injected IV or insufflated into the nose, an intense euphoria is common, usually lasting only about 15 to 30 minutes. However, with increasing dose, anxiety, paranoia, and hallucination is possible. Seizures, pronounced elevations in body temperature, and ultimately respiratory paralysis occur as drug levels increase. The cardiovascular actions are often the most prominent with tachycardia, hypertension, angina, and myocardial arrhythmias being noted rather frequently. As with other drugs that can be transported illicitly, cocaine can be packaged for internal transport, often encased in condoms. The image comes from a case in which an individual fell ill on an air flight and was admitted with the suspicion of such body packing. While being treated for hypertension, tachycardia, and convulsions, he was given mineral oil because he had not defecated during his admission. Unfortunately, mineral oil dissolves latex condoms, and his situation worsened over the following 24 hours, and he ultimately died of refractory ventricular fibrillation. It was noted on autopsy that 71 of 156 packages in his intestine had ruptured. The title of the article from which this was taken, Do Not Give Paraffin to Packers. And paraffin is another name for mineral oil. And it can be found in The Lancet in a 1998 issue. In contrast to cocaine, the amphetamines, in particular methamphetamine, are relatively easy and cheap to produce and have become a major problem in rural states like Mississippi. You should remember from autonomic pharmacology that amphetamines have actions on monoaminergic neurons that are more complex than those of cocaine. To that end, amphetamines can directly release dopamine from nerve terminals into the synapse they can release dopamine from synaptic vesicles into the neuron. They can inhibit monoamine oxidase degradation of intraneuronal dopamine. And they can reverse the neuronal membrane dopamine transporter, also increasing synaptic levels of dopamine. As you get into higher doses of cocaine, you begin to have somewhat similar effects on noradrenergic neurons. And finally, at even higher doses, you begin to affect also serotonergic neuronal function. It turns out that the methoxylation of amphetamine structures adds additional complexity to amphetamine abuse. The most recognized agent in this class of methoxylated amphetamines is ecstasy, or methylene dioxymethamphetamine. But there are a wide variety of structural congeners that have been introduced into the drug abuse market. This class, like the next two that we will present, 
has produced a kind of chemical arms race with chemists producing a large number of simple chemical structural changes that create unique designer drugs to escape regulatory oversight. The methoxylated amphetamines as a class tend to be associated with a higher likelihood of hallucinations than unmethoxylated amphetamines. And this is believed to be caused by a greater interaction of this class of agents with serotonergic neurons, as we'll see in a moment. At lower doses, they cause a marked euphoria, and the term empathogens has been coined to describe their propensity to cause emotional bonding and sexual orientation. The agents also tend to increase body temperature and heat exhaustion, rhabdomyolysis, and kidney failure have all been described. And coming back, in addition, a unique serotonergic neurotoxicity that is characterized by a reduction in the number and size of serotonergic dendrites throughout several areas of the brain has been seen in long-term high-dose users. Yet another group of drugs with marked effects on monoaminergic neuronal function are called the synthetic cathinones, sometimes called bath salts. These agents have rather similar structures and look a lot like autonomic agonists, particularly phenylephrine and ephedrine. All of them tend to inhibit the vesicular monoamine transporter that exists in synaptic vesicles also known as VMAT, as their primary mode of action. They all have rather amphetamine-like toxicities. Cathinone itself is a naturally occurring compound in the Middle Eastern shrub cat, the leaves of which have been used, typically chewed, for centuries for their mild stimulatory effects. Methcathinone, which is chemically identical to ephedrone, and related compounds like methadrone have been developed and are widely abused. Prior to 2012, these synthetic cathinones were not recognized by the DEA and were freely available. The 2012 Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act allowed many of these to be regulated as Schedule I agents by the DEA. The piperazines represent another group of formerly unregulated stimulants, hence the name legal end ecstasy. The popularity of the piperazines rose following the regulation of ecstasy by the DEA in the early 1980s. Most are simply designated as an alphanumeric sequence, and most are now recognized by and considered as Schedule I agents by the DEA. In general, they have similar effects to those of the methoxylated amphetamines. The stimulatory dissociative anesthetics are a unique group of drugs frequently abused, containing both ketamine and fencyclidine, the latter of which is known as PCP, or angel dust, this class exerts marked stimulatory effects at doses below those that cause anesthesia. PCP itself was originally developed as an animal tranquilizer, and it remains illegal in the United States. Ketamine, however, has been found to be quite effective in managing acute pain and in treating depression, and is in resurgence clinically. The cartoon here refers to the fact that upon emergence from higher dose ketamine induced anesthesia, a large proportion of patients will suffer an excitatory emergence phenomenon characterized by euphoria, vivid dreams, illusions, delirium, and hallucinations. The pharmacology of this class of agents is complex but we believe that blockade of the NMDA glutamate receptor is responsible for most of the clinically observed effects. At higher doses, these agents, but particularly PCP, 
have a reputation for inducing very aggressive and psychotic behaviors that can make patients very difficult to control. Also, at these higher doses, body temperature tends to rise. That, coupled with intense muscular activity during psychotic episodes, has led to rhabdomyolysis and renal failure in patients. You should also be aware of uh, synthetic ketamine derivatives, of which uh, methoxetamine is one example. Methoxetamine is now recognized as a uh, Schedule I agent. GI distress, anxiety, and paranoid behaviors have been described in the individuals who are intoxicated on methoxetamine. Moving now into a completely different set of abuse drugs, the class known as inhalants refers to substances that are often freely available, either as organic solvents, gasoline, plastic modeling glue, etc. Because of this ready, ready, ready availability, inhalants are often seen in use by preteens and teens. In 2020, there was a marked uptick in the frequency of misuse of this class by eighth graders in the Monitoring the Future study. In 2021, the rate of reported use has fallen back somewhat. As you might expect, organic solvents exert widespread toxicities as they dissolve lipid membranes. Much of this toxicity is irreparable. Also included under this category are agents like anesthetic gases, nitrous oxide, chloroform, ether, and volatile nitrites like amyl nitrite or poppers. To some extent, use of these has increased with vaping behavior in high school aged individuals. Huffing or the use of a paper bag or rag permeated with one of these substances should be suspected in younger patients who present as if they were inebriated with alcohol, but in whom wheezing is pronounced or when a typical glue sniffer's rash around the nose and lips is noticed. The final category we're going to mention is abuse of androgenic anabolic steroids. Unfortunately, this class is complicated. It includes not only the steroids themselves, but often a host or stack of other compounds. These may include pro-hormones, growth factors, agents that block unwanted actions of testosterone or estrogen, and often monoaminergic agents to increase conversion of body fat to heat energy. All of these make managing uh, individuals who are engaged in anabolic androgenic steroid abuse uh, rather complicated. Now this slide runs through uh, a list of the most prominent adverse effects of anabolic androgenic steroid abuse in the adult male. If we ignore all these other potential complicating agents, these adverse effects of high dose use of anabolic androgenic steroids obviously affect multiple body systems. Among these, it should be noted that a psychological body image related dependence phenomenon on anabolic androgenic steroids has been described. Also, as you will learn from endocrine pharmacology, additional deleterious effects of exogenous androgenic anabolic steroids will be noted in adolescents and in females who abuse these compounds. So let me sum up this session and the overall presentation. The medical marijuana juggernaut is on its way to Mississippi and you will need to know how to respond. Understanding the DEA controlled drug schedule 
and watching reports like monitoring the future study will aid you in managing that and the constant undercurrent of drug abuse. You're going to learn more about the Mississippi Prescription Monitoring Program, or PMP, as an additional resource to aid you in managing patients and drug misuse. I appreciate your attention. This concludes the lectures on drugs of abuse. Goodbye.